as with uh, any time we consider what it means to give, God says, don't be hard-hearted or tight-fisted. And we start from a place of gratitude that God has not been hard-hearted or tight-fisted with us, but has been infinitely more generous than we can explain or understand. In our small groups right now, uh, we've been learning to confess our sin. A few weeks ago, uh, Manny gave us, our groups, a list of 21 questions to help guide us, uh, to help us see our life with God more clearly. Uh, these questions come from John Wesley, one of the, the great spiritual fathers in our tradition. And as you read through his questions, you immediately see Wesley's wisdom. Uh, for instance, when it comes to money, right? Just imagine for a second, um, you are looking for sin in your life. And specifically, you're trying to find the money sin. And so what kinds of questions might you ask for that kind of assessment or evaluation? Maybe, you know, did I give enough money to God this week or this month or this year? Did I, did I give enough of my money to the poor? Did I, did I spend my money wisely or unwisely? Right? There are so many questions you could ask, but John Wesley has a profound insight when it comes to sin. Sin isn't just doing the wrong thing, like spending too much money on yourself. Sin, at its heart, is living disconnected from God, from the source of life. So, I mean, you could technically do the right thing. You could give the exact right amount of money. You could s respond uh, in the exactly right way to, to every person who's in need. And you could still live disconnected from God. And, and the opposite is true. You could do mostly the wrong things and still be close to God. I don't know if that's your experience of living close to God. I uh, often mostly aware of how consistently I do the wrong things. John Wesley cares more about the latter, right? His question is, do you pray about how you spend your money? That, that's his money question. This question for me in my life is consistently one of the hardest uh, and most convicting of the 21. Uh, I, I've been meeting with a couple guys for years to practice a confession of sin. And there are some weeks where I need to say this one out loud, but I just don't because I feel embarrassed by how often <laughs> I, I need to confess this one. So I say it a bunch of weeks, and then some weeks I'm just like, oh, I don't want to say it again. Before ever asking a single question about how I'm spending my money, what I'm spending it on, and whether I am being generous and faithful with it, it's obvious that, that this is like a, an entire area of my life that is far too often disconnected from God. I don't know, there's something about having more than enough it just feels deadly to the soul. Not because money by itself corrupts us or, or makes us wicked, but, but more than enough is often just, just enough to lead me to trust in myself and in my own wisdom rather than to turn to God. It should be obvious by now after Ali's reading and this intro that we're talking about money this morning. And every time I prepare a sermon about money, I worry about all of the people I know who have told me that they don't go to church because it seems like all pastors ever talk about is money. And I have this terrifying nightmare, recurring nightmare, that it would, that it would be a Sunday like this morning when all of them show up at the same time. But I have to talk about money, but at least I get to talk about it from one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. That might seem weird, 
but the passage that Ali read this morning is one of my favorites. It's the passage that Jesus is quoting. When a woman comes and pours an expensive bottle of ointment on his head. When the disciples criticize her, calling her wasteful, this, this ointment could have been sold and the money used it given to the poor, they scold her. But then Jesus tells them to leave her alone. Jesus calls her act beautiful. And then he says, you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. There are so many things happening in that story. But when Jesus says, you always have the poor with you, he's quoting Moses in Deuteronomy 15. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard people misquote Jesus quoting Moses. You always have the poor with you, they say. And this becomes a justification for not helping the poor, right? There will always be another chance to help the poor. They will always be there. The other thing is most important right now. Give to this project. Spend on this wasteful luxury. I once heard a preacher compare the private plane that he needed to the expensive ointment the woman wasted on Jesus' head. According to him, the plane was an equally beautiful gift for the Lord. And not to worry about the poor that could have been helped because you will always have the poor with you. Yeah. 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 Right, so is, it, is that really what Jesus meant? Is this what Moses meant? And maybe you already noticed during our reading earlier that while Moses did say there will never cease to be poor in the land, he also said just a few verses earlier, there will be no poor among you. So which is it, right? Is, is Moses confused? Did he accidentally strike himself with his own staff in the head? Will there be or won't there be? That is the question. And the answer is surprisingly simple. Moses says God's blessing will be abundant and more than enough for the people if only you will strictly obey the voice of Yahweh your God, being careful to do all this commandment that I command you today. And what is Moses commanding? Well, there are actually four commands that we just heard uh, Ali read for us. First, the Israelites are to bring a tenth of everything they produce to God. Um, at, at the end of each of their harvests, they are to bring 10% to the temple, and as well as any firstborn animals born to them should also be brought to the temple. And there at the temple, they should be given to God, but also, <clears throat> I just got something stuck in my throat. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, wow, that doesn't happen usually. Okay, <laughs> so where were we? <laughs> and so at the temple right there where the people are bringing an offering, <laughs> um, they, they should be given to God, but also enjoyed as part of a, a meal. Remember Wesley's question about praying about our money? See, Wesley is drawing on Moses, who wants to make sure the Israelites aren't just giving to check it off a to-do list. God is inviting the Israelites into a deep and present relationship with him, where, where they enjoy God's presence and they learn to trust him. And so their gift includes God giving a gift back which is a meal with God himself. The second 
command. Hey, thanks. The second command states that every three years, everyone who lives in a town should take 10% of their harvest and then pool them together in the town and store it together in one collection. So Bible scholars aren't sure generally whether this is 10% in addition to the 10% that you would have taken to the temple every year, or if this 10% is in place of the 10 that you would have taken to the temple. But regardless, the purpose of this 10% is clear. These are the resources that an Israelite town would have available to share with any foreigners who might, might be traveling through, along with uh, any orphans in the town, any widows in the town, um, those who didn't have family or support structures to care for them. And it would also be for any Levites who lived in the area since they had been prohibited from owning their own land. So first, it's 10% to the temple every year. Then it's 10% to your town every three years. Third, at the end of every seven years, the Israelites were to release all fellow Israelites from any debt still owed. I don't really have anything to add to that. It's just pretty straightforward and kind of amazing. Just think about I mean, like our current political debate in our country over forgiving a fraction of people's student debt. Like, now you can like imagine a society where every seven years, like clockwork, your debt is just gone. It's not an issue for political parties to take sides on. It just happens because God's law decrees it. The fourth command is a fascinating follow-up to the third because the fourth command has Moses explicitly telling the Israelites that if a fellow Israelite comes upon hard times becoming poor, then they shall lend to him enough to meet his need, whatever it may be. Notice how the fourth and third work together. Moses anticipates the exact thing that people are going to think that after they are required to forgive all debts every seven years, which is he is saying the quiet part out loud for us. Deuteronomy 15, 9, he says, take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart. And you say the seventh year, the year of release is near and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother and you give him nothing. And he cried to Yahweh against you and you be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him because for this Yahweh your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. Again, here are the four commands. 10% to the temple every year, 10% to your town every three years. Forgive all Israelite debts every seven years and lend to every Israelite in need. Moses takes these four commands and then he sums them up with this one command at the very end of our passage in verse 11. He just says, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. If you do this, Moses says, there will be no poor among you. There will be more than enough. You all will live blessed lives in the blessing of God. In fact, he goes on to say, there will be so much among you that other nations will come to you for help. And when you help them, Pagan nations, nations that know nothing of your God, they will experience the abundance of Yahweh's blessing. They will see Yahweh's goodness and provision. If you do this, Yahweh, or the world will know your God. Now this is a massive if. And Moses 
has spent too much time with these people. He knows which way this is gonna go. He lays out the path of life in front of them, but then makes clear the path that he knows that they are gonna take. And he says, there will never cease to be poor among you. Which brings us back to Jesus, quoting Moses. Because when Jesus says, you will always have the poor among you, is he giving his disciples permission to ignore the poor, those who are in need, and to make them secondary? Or is Jesus bringing Moses' judgment forward into his present day, reminding his people that the very fact that there are any poor Israelites among them is a sign of judgment against God's people, against their economy, and against their very way of life. This single expensive gift from the woman was in no way going to bring about economic justice for God's people. Too much more was required. Too many powerful hands in society were closed fisted. See, while many Israelites practiced giving 10% of their income, widows and orphans and foreigners were often being neglected. After losing their homes, widows were, were finding the economic system of their day, demanding them from them even their final two coins. You might remember a story in the temple with, with a widow just like that. Loans were given, but often without much of a chance to ever pay them back. And certainly very few people were released of any of their debts, at least not systematically, and especially not every seven years. And so neglecting God's command, the poor were always among God's people. That is until two things happened. The first thing has to do with a man named Zacchaeus. And some of you know that uh, one of my favorite accounts in all of the Gospels is the encounter that Jesus has with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, a hard-hearted, tight-fisted, greedy man, robbing his own people, growing rich on the backs of the poor, this man is transformed in the presence of Jesus. His heart is softened. His hands are opened. And he begins to give freely. But Zacchaeus doesn't just give a gift. I mean, he, like, he does do that. He gives to the poor half of his wealth. But Something else is at work in Zacchaeus because Jesus declares that salvation has come to this man's house today. Zacchaeus is being saved from his money, from his love of money, from his trust in his money, but also Jesus is bringing salvation to debtors through Zacchaeus, right? Because everyone he has defrauded is getting paid back four times what he took from them. Like these are people who are being released from their debts in such a powerful way that screams the glory and power of our God who can change hearts. What happens in Zacchaeus is not a, a one-off. Zacchaeus isn't an outlier because when the spirit of Jesus falls on the church in its first days, Zacchaeus becomes the norm for the whole community. This is the second thing that takes place. Most of you have heard this before, but the book of Acts recounts that as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to any as any had need, to each as any had need. It's, it's, it's really easy to read over some of the plurals here, but since we don't have much evidence that, that early followers of Jesus were selling all of their possessions and becoming homeless to follow Jesus, it makes sense to read this as those who owned more than one parcel of land and those who owned more than one home. And others were sharing out of their resources as well. 
but owners with lands or houses, those with more than enough, sold their extra to meet every need within the church, this new community of Jesus followers. These same Jesus followers are sharing everything they have in common. In other words, they've gone way beyond sharing 10% of their produce every three years. But what are they doing with these resources? Well, we're told that they're sharing meals together, including the Lord's Supper. Uh, They establish a program to make sure that all of the widows in their family are cared for. They, They distribute resources to anyone in need. The whole community lives out the salvation of Zacchaeus. Salvation for the rich as they are set free from their riches and salvation for the poor as they have every need met. If all you know is Jesus saying, you will always have the poor among you, then you will be completely and utterly shocked when the book of Acts declares there was not a needy person among them. But if you have Deuteronomy 15 in the thoughts of your heart and you know the power of God to save us from our sins, then it shouldn't surprise you at all when Acts declares this this was God's plan from the beginning. And in Jesus, it comes to pass and becomes a reality. Now the early church doesn't follow Deuteronomy to the letter of the law. Instead, the church filled with the Spirit of God, committed to prayer, and practicing wise discernment together as a community. They figure out how to put the four commands of Deuteronomy 15 into practice in a new day, capturing in their lives the spirit of the law, the law of love, as they live it out in a radically new way. This is what God wants to do in us and through us. And so, may salvation come to this house today. May our hearts of stone be replaced with hearts of flesh, open and soft. May closed fists be opened to those in need. May grudging gifts be replaced with joyful giving. And may it be said that there was no one in need in God's family. Will you pray today about how you, how we will spend the money that God has given us.